Ja, ja. Ja, <音><音><音> 就是这个讲说的形式啊有任何意见都可以跟我们说都反正是匿名的就跟我们说 in classical analysis, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, you're giving solutions, or at least proving solutions exist. Um, from a logician's point of view, this is second-order arithmetic. And so you're dealing with the natural numbers and sets of natural numbers, but nothing bigger than that. So your, your foundations aren't going to matter very much at all. And you're not going to be dealing with using abstract mathematical constructions because that's, that's what you're working with. Uh, until you reach some parts of functional analysis or cohomological formulations in complex analysis, which, like I say, I'm a little surprised, but in the past couple of years, every graduate textbook I went to on complex analysis, the third chapter or so is about cohomology. It's simply a good organizing device. It's not a powerful, weird tool. It's just a good organizing device. But it's it's categorically formulated. It always, it always has been. Um, so this classical stuff doesn't, the category theory just doesn't come into it when you're actually solving specific differential equations. Although it does when you start using some of those, some of those methods. Computational methods, except for some perspectives on data types and object-oriented programming. Now there are some perspectives in, in theoretical computer science and not just theoretical, like object-oriented programming, where, where categorical ideas that help people to understand. The idea here with data types, you don't want to tell the computer how to do the calculations. You want to tell it some specific things about what kinds of results should be possible, and you want the computer to figure out how to do those calculations. When you want, if you want lists of, of natural numbers, you want to say, okay, given a list and a natural number, I can make a new list that has that one on top. Given any list, I can find out what the top number is. I don't want to decide how the computer is going to do this. I just want a data type where I can always put a new number on top and I can always break off the top number. And so computer scientists are always figuring, what's, how elegantly can I design that, describe that data type? We have to build a machine that will calculate it. Right. We, the computer has to get this done, but you want the programmer not to know how the computer is doing it, because you want the comp programmer just thinking about numbers, not about the machine. So, and some of that work has been inspired by, by categorical ideas. But the computations themselves, they're computations. You give these computations in a way that somebody could have done, you could have shown these computations to Newton or Euler, and they would have thought, great, these are good calculations. There's no, no category theory. Uh, and I mentioned those in connection with Professor Barbaro, and maybe I didn't stress this enough. Professor Barbaro, who I had up there early on, Alethea Barbaro, does these models of fish behavior, gangs. These are very computational models. These are meant to actually help the Icelandic fishing industry design policies. They're help, meant to help the Los Angeles Police Department. So these things have to, have to give actual numbers in, numbers out, actual calculations, and that doesn't really use a categorical perspective. I brought her up because the reason I brought her up is because even though her work doesn't use a categorical perspective, she just never uses that, she knows that for abstract math, that's the way it's done. Because it's just, this is just something that the mathematicians know. Um, differential geometry, 
Again, classical differential geometry, a categorical perspective isn't going to matter until you look to connections on fiber bundles. Now, there's a, there's a lot of current work about curvature on, on differential manifolds that, that actually does end up using category theory. But the basics, they're just too concrete. They, they don't. These are fields where a categorical perspective really doesn't matter. It's not that the things couldn't be organized as categories, and there's certainly no difficulty giving a, a formal foundation for these using, say, categorical set theory. It just doesn't matter very much. It's the people in these fields are not going to think about it because it's not going to make a difference. But that's not an objection to category theory. I mean, there's no objection to cars that we don't want to have one in this room, right? There's there for other things. <laughs> Model theory of piano arithmetic, or ZFC, currently is not using much category theory. I will say the class models of ZFC, Penn Manning has had some students, they're wondering, maybe when we want to study these problems, say, I don't know, some of your logicians will know about this, Reinhold cardinals. They're sort of very large cardinal sets. They're so large that they can't exist if the axiom of choice is true. It's not known whether they could exist when the axiom of choice is false. And to study these, you sometimes you want to look at your universe of all sets, or your possible universe of all sets. But you want to look, I mean, you want to look at it as one thing, so that's a proper class. Well, ZFC per se doesn't talk about proper classes. You can define them by formulas, but that is inadequate to this work. You need to actually be able to manipulate them. And she wondered if maybe the category of categories would make a nice neutral context. You can look at your model of, of set theory in this context. So when I say neutral, I mean the context isn't going to determine a lot about the model. It will let you work with the model without the context having put much in it. So that's a possibility. But the other thing is here, definability and O minimality are pervasively categorical, and in fact sharply influenced by Alexander Grotendi in, in his algebraic geometry. So there are lots of parts where category theory doesn't really make a difference. But from a, from a philosophy of math point of view, I want to stress, that's not an objection to category theory. Set theory doesn't make a difference in these parts either. These parts function very well without, without any real sensitivity to their foundation at all. And, and there, obviously, this is, this is important, but... So anyway, having, having said that, some people say number theory. I used to hear this a lot. Oh, number theory doesn't use category theory. And if you get a first or second graduate textbook on number theory, it probably won't use any category theory. But it's still wrong. Tufnus theory derived half of category theory were invented to solve a problem in number theory. They were invented for that purpose. They were used for that purpose. They succeeded at that purpose. Let's say half of modern category theory was invented by Grotendi, pursuing problems in number theory. Derived from cohomology, it's, it's a categorical method. The category theory is just keeping track of data. Again, category theory over and over again, I want to say, it's not some weird new perspective that comes in and changes a lot. It's a way of organizing the data. But it's a way that everybody uses in mainstream advanced number theory now, these derived, this derived functor cohomology. I mentioned uh, Fields metals to, to Grotendi and Delaney and Faultings for solving very specific problems in number theory. Uh, Faultings proved something that Andre Bay had suggested and then Mordell suggested more. If you look at Polynomial equations, diophantine problems, you've got some polynomial you want to know if it has integer solutions. Like, the, the, well, like say the most famous one, a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. Does that have integer solutions? And we now know, now know it doesn't. Um, Faulting's proved a theorem that they had conjectured. This if you look at this as a polynomial on the complex numbers, you can look at this as describing a a subspace of, of three-dimensional complex space, a complex algebraic variety. And that's, that surface has a certain geometry. And they conjectured that for any equation, 
any equation in any number of, of variables, look at the complex surface it defines. If that complex surface has more than a certain complexity, is, is well, I won't just define what the complexity is, but it's related to how many holes there are on a surface. If the surface that it defines actually, if it has more than one hole in it, then this equation has at most finitely many integer solutions. This geometric fact about the complex solutions should determine there's at most finitely many integer solutions to this polynomial. This was very hard to prove. This was proved in about 1985. Notice this implies that there's at most finitely many exceptions to the Fermat's last theorem. But nobody was really happy to know there's at most finitely many. They wanted to know are there any. But all things proved this using derived functor cohomology. Wiles uses this to prove Fermat's last theorem. Uh, so it's just completely wrong to say that number theory doesn't use, doesn't use category theory. Uh, I once asked Barry Mazur, have they ever had a course on category theory in Harvard Math Department? He said, no, absolutely not. They would never have a course on category theory. But when you look in the catalog, three of their courses say includes an introduction to category theory. They would never have a course on it. But three of their courses say, we're going to teach you a little bit of it because you're going to use it in this course. Uh, and Wiles, of course, Wiles didn't get a Fields Medal. Maybe because he was too old, by one point he was over 40 when he finished the group. Under, but I also think part of the reason they didn't give him a Fields Medal is it would be a waste. Andrew Wiles is the only mathematician in the world who couldn't be more famous if you gave him a Fields Medal. The, the, the Fields Medal would not increase his reputation, because you can't increase his reputation. Uh, the math department at Oxford is the Andrew Wiles building. There is not a plaque on the, on the building that says Andrew Wiles building. It's carved into the building. <laughs> they carved his name into the, into the building of that. So, yeah, just completely wrong to say category theory isn't used in number theory. It was in, lots of it was invented for number theory, and it works. Still, Terry Tao's 2006 Fields Medal, Nigel Bargava's 2014 Fields Medal, does not use category theory, nor does Jiangy Tang's work on distribution of primes. These people all do number, extremely important, fascinating, exciting number theory that, that, that may end up proving the twin, the twin prime conjecture. Uh, and there were, that work does not use category theory. Um, I do know that Tao and, and Bargabal, they also know the derived functor of but they don't use it in the work that one of the fields does. So yeah, there's lots of work that doesn't, that's not influenced by category theory, but no, nothing's incompatible with it. Uh, we talked about a, a terminal object in category. It's a, an object that everything has exactly one arrow to. So this is, it's, a, it's slightly interesting. The category of, uh, an initial object is one that has exactly one arrow to every object. The category of sets, the singleton sets are terminal, the empty set is, is initial, and they're different, of course. And the category of groups has initial and terminal objects, but they're the same. So we've already seen one little difference, one purely categorical difference between mathematical things. Sets versus groups. Sets, initial and terminal are different, groups they're the same. It's extremely important that groups are the same. Uh, we did that. Um, it's a definite, oh, we, we, we talked about that. Oh, uh, I didn't talk about large categories that have no terminal objects. Take the category of infinite sets and all functions between them. Any two infinite sets have infinitely many functions between them. There, there can't be a terminal object there. I call it a logic example because it's well defined. It's not important in mathematics, but it's well defined. There's a large category, perfectly nice large category. Uh, it's got lots of things you can construct in it, but it does not have terminal or initial objects. 
very important math example, the category of fields and field homomorphisms has no terminal object. And this comes up, well, this is extremely important in algebraic geometry. The reason I start with the logic example is probably a lot of you won't see the point of this, but, it, but the, the technical fact is any field you take, most other fields have no map to it at all, no arrow to it in that category. Uh, for those of you who know these things, a field has a characteristic. It's either zero or some prime number. If one field has a map to another, they have to have the same characteristic. Fields with characteristic two never have any maps to fields with characteristic three. So nothing can be a terminal object in fields. Uh, there is a famous project to modify the notion, the, the category of fields to get some, what they call a one element field. It's a famous project. It, it, it's meant to solve some problems in algebraic geometry, but it's famous because such a field does not really exist. This would, this would sort of be like a terminal object. But uh, really, uh, two simple theorems that set the patterns for many proofs in category theory, really for all the proofs in category theory, in principle. Um, any two terminal objects in a category are isomorphic. We're going to show over and over again. We're going to construct, some, we're going to have some idea. We're going to say there might be lots of these, but any two of them are isomorphic. This is going to, this comes up a lot. Um, in Lang's algebra, he said, talks about the tensor product of two modules. He gives a categorical definition of the tensor product. He says, there might be many different tensor products for these two modules, but they will all be isomorphic. So it doesn't matter that there's a lot of them. They're all isomorphic. I think philosophers of math now are, are used to the idea that when things are isomorphic, they have all the same properties. And, and that, will, that will be true. But we're going to see how to prove that, because that's how you prove basically everything. Well, also, any object isomorphic to a terminal object is terminal. So this is, if you've got a terminal object, anything isomorphic to it has that same property. Isomorphic things have all the same properties. And it's worth seeing how you prove them. If we've got two terminal objects in C, then immediately each has an arrow to the other. In fact, they each have a unique arrow to the other, but we don't need that. So the composite goes from T to T. And of course, the identity goes from T to T. But T is terminal, so there's only one arrow to it from anything, including from itself. So that composite is the identity. Same reason shows the other composite is the identity, so they're inverse to each other, and those things are isomorphic. It's a simple proof. I bring it up because this pattern is going to occur again and again in category theory. The data immediately say that certain few arrows exist. In this case, the arrows, the arrow to t, the arrow to t prime, and they're composite. The data gives you that immediately. One of these arrows has a key property that only an identity arrow can have. In this case, oh, uh, that's, no. that should be from T to T. I'm sorry, I changed the notation. Um, only an identity arrow can go from T, from T to T, and so that arrow is the identity. The proof is, is constructive from the data. Uh, in a sense, but the data aren't constructively reasonable. Now, the data told me T is terminal and T prime is isomorphic to it. And given that fact, this is all constructive. I find an explicit isomorphism. But what you can't expect is to find this first isomorphism explicitly. You, in, in general, just knowing the two things are isomorphic doesn't let you find that isomorphism. So the old sense of constructive math was we're only going to do things where we can actually find the solutions. Here, we start by assuming that certain solutions exist that we really couldn't expect to find. So it's still technically constructive because we assumed the solution exists and then we used it. But old, sad fashioned constructive mathematicians would not like it because they'd say, Where did you get off assuming? 
I, I don't know, given two objects, I don't know what test to tell whether they're isomorphic. Believe me, there cannot be a general test for taking two objects and telling whether they're isomorphic. Um, in, in, in very natural presentations of the category of finite sets, the question of whether a set is a singleton is undecidable. I assume certain data that normally can't be decidable, recursively decidable. Now, given that data, I proceeded constructively. And this, um, well, okay, here's the, the proof of theorem two. We know, now we're going to suppose that one is terminal. I, I like to use the name one for an object that I know is terminal. This is suggests singleton set. And T for a, an object that I'm not sure about yet, but I'm. Suppose one is terminal and T is isomorphic. We want to show that T is terminal. We want to show every object has a unique map to it. The data immediately tell us there's some isomorphism one to t. That's what it said. It said t is isomorphic. So there's some, again, this is not this is not a genuinely constructive step because it's implausible that we would just happen to know that. But the data immediately say there's an isomorphism in an arrow. So compose them. This is this is what we just said. We just said that a has an arrow to one and one has an arrow to t. That so compose them. There is at least one arrow from a to t. We're trying to show that every A has a unique arrow to T. The data immediately tell us there's at least one. And any two of them have to be equal. Here I've stretched this out. Take any F and G that both go from A to T. Unfortunately, that should be T. That's a, that's a typo. Well, this function, of course, it's the identity followed by itself. Everything is the identity followed by itself. The identity factors is V, V inverse. We're told that V is an isomorphism. It has an inverse function. It has an inverse arrow. So regroup. We know that V inverse F is the same as V inverse T because they are both arrows to 1 and 1 is terminal. So we know these two are equal, so we know that V composed with them is equal. But then the V comes out and that's just G. Now. I'm stretching this out a lot. I'm aware when I talk about this, people are saying, hey, you know, category theory was supposed to be simple, but here's this long proof. I'm, I'm, I'm laying out all the steps in immense detail, because I want, I want you to see the pattern. But the proof is really very short. Since one is terminal, uh, isomorphic to T, anything, everything has at least one map to T, but it can't have more than one, because since this is an isomorphism, any map to T factors through it. So it factors through one, and so it's unique. So we're just going, we're just going directly from the data. I want, I, I want to say that the, the nearly constructive nature of category theory, it, it, it really is an intriguing problem. Um, so many proofs in, in category theory are, are almost constructive. Actually, I don't, I don't be able to keep track of the time. So I have to. Yeah. I noticed when I've done, I've done every exercise in Saunders and McLean's categories for the working mathematician. I thought it was really fun. You should do every exercise in McLean's book. Um, uh, three of them I proved they were wrong. They can't be done. And there were three that I couldn't do, but I never proved they were wrong. Um, the three is pretty low for a book that long. Um, and almost all of them, what you do is you look at the problem. The problem specifies, well, like I said here, The problem itself tells you that a few arrows exist. Those arrows solve the problem. The ones that you immediately saw exist, they solve the problem. How do they solve the problem? You put them together the only way you could. You draw the only conclusions that immediately come from the data, you put them together the only way you can, and that's the proof of the, of the problem. This is completely unlike, say, classical analysis. 
you want to show that there's a function with some property, this may be a very complicated construction. In category theory, the proofs are very rarely complicated constructions. It's, it's clever to notice that the, it really, in category theory, general category theory, it's generally the clever part of a theorem is thinking that it could be true. It's not proving it once you've thought of it. Because the proof once you've thought of the theorem is, is generally pretty automatic. The problem situation only gives you a couple of arrows. There's only a couple ways you can put them together. And that way solves the problem. The, the, like I say, the achievement is realizing that it could be done. So this is, it's nearly constructive. And I've given six mutually contradictory possible explanations. I don't know why category theory is so often this way. One possibility, category theory is so general, nothing weaker than explicit constructions can work across the whole range of it. The category axioms put almost no constraints on what a category could be. They apply to all kinds of mathematical objects. I'll tell you that terminal objects in the category of groups, it's just the one element group. In the category of sets, it's, it's any one element set. In a category of, of schemes over, over some base scheme, it's not so simple. There are lots of categories used in mathematics where the terminal objects are not simple things at all, but they're all unique up to isomorphism. A, theor a theorem is not going to be true in category theory unless it's true for all kinds of mathematical structures. And maybe that's such a wide range. The only way something can work and over all these possible structures is if it works explicitly. It actually tells you what to do. It tells you how to construct the answer and that answer. Maybe, maybe that's a thing. Maybe only explicit constructions can be general enough to work in the whole generality of category theory. On the other hand, maybe the right answer is that category theory conceals non-constructivity in its basics. Like I said, that, that thing where I said assume T is isomorphic to 1. That's not a plausible constructive assumption. Um, maybe, maybe the construct, maybe category theory shouldn't be seen as kind of constructive. What we should do is say, hey, well, when you look at what you're, when you look at the, at your assumptions, you're not being constructive at all. You're proceeding constructively from them, but they have no constructive plausibility. So it's really not constructive. Maybe it's just not. Um, Maybe it's just too young to need non-constructive proofs. Non-constructive proofs come out after you've developed lots of complex apparatus. Of course, it's not as young as it used to be. So I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, you might, have, you might have said that in 1950, but even by 1955, Grotendieck can prove so many things that, that, that I don't know if, if that's plausible. Another possibility, a lot of it was created for computer science. And computer scientists typically only want constructive methods because they want things that computers can actually get done. Maybe that's the right thing. Maybe category theory gives such direct access to structure, it gets so much out of our way that it naturally finds explicit solutions. Um, because really when you when you read a book like Lang's Algebra, the categorical organization, it really does help you see how, you know, how to organize your problems. How to, how to, not only how to prove the theorems in the book, but how to realize which theorems should be proved. What's going to help you here? Which theorems are actually going to be applicable? And the categorical formulation in that book, Serge Lang is not particularly interested in category theory. He's interested in writing good books. And it, and it works. Um, maybe that's it. It just gives such direct access to structure. Or maybe it's that the category axioms have such a weak logical form that there's little occasion for non-constructive methods. Uh, those of you who are logicians will notice the category axioms, they almost never use existential quantifiers. The only existential quantifier in the category axioms says, given f 
from A to B, and G from B to C. There exists GF from A to C with certain properties. But that's not exactly, as if, if you're a logician, you'll notice that's not exactly an existential quantifier because there's a unique one. It's really a partial function. Partial functions are much tamer logically than the general case of existential quantification. This, a, a, an existential quantifier might leave you wanting the axiom of choice. For all of these data, for each of these data in the set, I know there is a solution. But there might be many solutions, so it's now axiom of choice to pick one solution for each. Uh, but if for each of the data I know there's a unique solution, that's not axiom of choice anymore. Just take the unique solution. So there's no genuine existential quantification in the, in the category axioms. And there are, there are, no, there are no quantifier changes. Uh, you might say the axioms have this form. They say for every situation there exists. But again, this is not a genuine universal quantifier. You just use three variables. And what you don't have is there exists and for all. This pattern just doesn't occur in the axioms. So maybe the axioms are just so logically weak. Non-constructive methods are typically methods for dealing with things like this. And maybe the, just the, the axioms are just so weak that there's no occasion for non-constructive methods. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, in an application, lots of complications can happen. Yeah, yeah. A given, a given category, a specific category you're describing, a category of schemes over some ring, yes, you will have, you will have these things happening. Um, oh, if somebody was asking me about automata. Yeah, yeah, you can take categories of Turing machines, you can formulate, formulate that stuff categorically. The category of Turing machines with, say, translations of morphisms is going to be as complicated as the notion of Turing machine because it's about Turing machine. So that category will have all this complexity. But that gets me back to this thing. The theorems of category theory hold all the time. So they hold for that complex case, but also for, for other com differently complex cases and other simpler cases. So the general theorems, the category theory, aren't going to penetrate far into the specific cases that have complex conditions on their objects and arrows. Now, in the case of scheme theory, where they're moderately complex, it's a great way to organize the subject. But we need more specialized theories about schemes theorems, than just general categorical axioms. So, I, I don't know why category theory is, is so often sort of constructive. I'm not dead sure it's fair to say that it's constructive. But, uh, but there, there's some thoughts on, on that. And why it is so important for, for you? Oh, oh. Yeah. well, you know, a lot of philosophers of mathematics are interested in constructive theories. And a lot of people respond to category theories, oh, that's just uh, general abstract nonsense. Well, you can call it general abstract nonsense if you want to. Lots of mathematicians do, uh, including Steenrod, who made himself famous by using that. Um, but precisely because it's so general, it's typically constructive, or nearly constructive. Uh, the, the other thing which we'll get to more tomorrow, when you look at a topos as a specific kind of category that's a lot like the category of sets, including the category of sets is one. But in, in general, in a topos, standard logic doesn't hold. It holds in the category of sets, but it doesn't hold in others. What does hold is a kind of constructive logic, a kind of intuitionistic logic. I think on, on that, I really want to say it's not really intuitionistic logic. The non-constructive parts are concealed in the basic definitions. But it looks like intuitionistic logic. So this has been something that a lot of logicians have thought about and asked me about. Why, you know, why is Topo's logic so close to Brouwer's intuitionism? I don't know why it's so close to Brouwer's intuitionism. I do know that it isn't exactly Brouwer's intuitionism. There's the basics are not anything Brower would accept. 
But it is, in some way, very close to Darwin's intuitionism, and I think, it, I think it's a really good problem. But let's look at a less trivial idea than terminal objects. It really works the same way. And so I want to introduce this idea so that you can see how it's really working the same way as terminal objects. It's not much less trivial. A product for two objects. In any category C, a product for two objects is a pair of arrows, such that for any pair of arrows, there's a unique, yeah, let me bring out the symmetry of, well, okay, I've got the drawing here. I think it's easier to see in a picture, but I think it's even easier to see in steps. Given objects A and B, a product for them is not just something like the Cartesian product in set theory. In, in set theory, we say A and B have a unique Cartesian product. It's a set of ordered pairs. But there's not a unique definition of ordered pair. There's really not a unique definition of, of Cartesian product. You might pick one and, and use it, but you know there's lots of others that work just as well. In category theory, we don't. We say, rather, what we say is, it's a set with projections. It's not just a set that's the, somehow the set of ordered pairs. It's a set with, it's an object with projections. So it's not a set at all, but it's an, it comes with projections. So it's not that P is the product of these two. It's that P, P together with these projection arrows is the product of them. And what makes it the product is that this is sort of universal among pairs of arrows to A and B. This is something with a pair of arrows. The idea is take anything with a pair of arrows. You might have lots of things with pairs of arrows to A and B. But anything you do, there is a unique arrow U to P, such that doing this, that's P to U, is that. And doing this, that's P1 to U, is that. So it's, it's an object with arrows to A and B. It's universal among objects with arrows to A and B. Anytime you've got an object with arrows to A and B, there's a unique map to this one that gives you those maps. I will think, I do think that for, it might be easier to see, yeah, in a more common notation. People use this notation a lot in category theory. We'll write this as A cross B. And we'll write this as the ordered pair FG. And then we're saying if you take the ordered pair FG, take its first projection, that's F. Take the ordered pair FG. Take a second projection, that's G. So people use this notation a lot. But as a philosopher, um, I want to point out, we haven't defined this object in any particular way. We've just said that it and those arrows do this. We have not said, if, if we're thinking in the category of sets, we have not said what set is A cross B. We haven't picked a definition of ordered pair. We haven't, we haven't defined elements at all yet. I've, I've never talked about elements of A or T or B or anything here in a category setting. Now there is a notion that, we, that, that we'll come to, but uh, we just haven't, we haven't talked about that. So even though we use this familiar notation, even if you're thinking of the category of sets, don't think this is the set of ordered pairs in any sense other than what's just given by this. In fact, this set is only defined up to isomorphism. This is, though, the property that mathematicians really use of products. And I say, compare Quine on ordered pairs. Quine in 1935 wrote a paper 
on how to give a set theoretic definition of ordered pairs that had a certain technical property. He spent the whole 1950s and 60s saying it doesn't matter. I guess for some reason, people must have, people must have jumped on him about that paper. He kept saying, in set theory, we're going to need to use ordered pairs. Ordered pairs of sets. We're going to need to use these a lot. What, a, what is the ordered pair? Well, one possibility is, let's say, it's the set one is singleton x and the other is both of them. I think I've got that right. I always I, because it doesn't my world. I think <laughs> how do you know if you've got it right? Klein says, here's how what you have to know. You have to know that for every x and y there is such a set. That's the first thing. We do that for every f and g there is some arrow here. You have to know for every x and y there is such a set, and you have to know that from this set you can recover x and y. You can discover what x and y were. Uh, that's, as we said over here, you can recover f and g from that arrow. So the properties we're giving here are just the properties. He says any definition will work as long as it has those properties. Does this have those, those properties? Okay, yes. X, this is the only thing that occurs as an element of two of those sets. Uh, these two sets might be equal, right, because it could happen that X equals Y. If X equals Y, then this is just singleton X, and this whole set is just... Okay, so X is, well, it's either the element of the only set here, or it's the only thing that's an element of both sets, depending on whether there's one or two. Y is the only thing that's an element of one of these sets and not of the other. So yes, this definition is adequate. And Quine wanted people to understand there's nothing magical about this definition of ordered pair, it's just that it's adequate. And that's because in 1935 he gave a much more complicated definition of ordered pair that solved some other logical problem. It was for use in his logic new in his set theory new foundations that has a set of all sets, but doesn't work very nicely. So he gave us an order, a definition that, that worked in that difficult context. So Quine's adequacy conditions, I, I really want to stress this, his quite adequacy conditions are quite right. You need to know that for any two, there is such an ordered pair. Well, we just change that a little bit. For any arrows f and g, there is an arrow there. But we just required it. We didn't find a way to get it. We just made it part of the definition. There has to be. It has to be. And given such a pair, you have to be able to recover the two elements. Well, we stipulate you can recover them by composing with the projections. So when you read Lang on, ab on, on abstract algebra, Munger's on topology, they're going to use Cartesian product a lot. And they are not going to tell you what an ordered pair is in set theoretic terms. But they are going to assume that whenever you've got maps to A and B, you've got a map to the product. And you can project back and discover and recover those. What they, what they actually use is that defining property. And Quine himself specifies the adequacy condition on any definition is precisely that, that it should make that definition work. In categorical set theory, we simply define it that way. That's all we do. In ZFC, it agrees up to isomorphism with any of the usual definitions of Cartesian product. But it doesn't pick one or the other. It just agrees. They all have that categorical property. But now we're wandering into foundations. I'm going to try to avoid foundations largely for today because it, it's necessarily it's complicated. Um, I do want to stress how products are defined up by somewhat this one. Compare theorems one and two. Theorem three. For any objects in a category, any two products are isomorphic. Theorem 1 said any two terminal objects are isomorphic. Now I'm going to say any two products of A and B are isomorphic. But remember, a product of A and B is now not just an object. It's an object with two arrows. 
if this is a product of A and B, And again, this is a product that's meant to be a Q. And again, this is a product of A and B. Then I want to know there's an isomorphism that commute that, that gets along with these with these arrows. Any object isomorphic to a product is also a product. That's going to be this thing. If I've got a product of A and B. and I've got an isomorphism of that thing to Q, then this Q together with these two is also a product. I will all do this more explicitly. So right now I want to stress theorem 1, any two terminal objects are isomorphic. Theorem 2, anything isomorphic to a terminal is a terminal. Now I'm just turning that into products of A and B. Yeah. To define uh, uh, isomorphism between uh, object with uh, two particles. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you that in the yeah. proof. Okay. It occurred to me as I was writing this, the way I'm doing this, I'm simplifying the theorem statements by putting some of the actual statement into the proof, which is the very thing I pointed out you don't want in research mathematics. You want oh, everything, everything that belongs in the statement in the statement. But this is an introductory lecture, so, so I'm going to put some of it into the proof. People used to do that all the time. We used to do most of the thing up here in the proof 100 years ago. So suppose these are both products. Well, we do what we always do. The, the data says, to say this is a product means, to say P is a product means anything with arrows to there has an arrow there, such that P1U, oh, Q, this is a Q, sorry. P1U equals Q2, and P2U, oh, Q1, sorry, no, is Q2. Yeah, that's, that's just the, the defining property of, of, of these things being an arrow, of being a product, is that thing has an arrow there, has an isomorphism, has a unique arrow there. We didn't say isomorphism, it says a unique, a unique arrow. We know there's a unique arrow there. But again, because Q is a product, we know there's an arrow, a unique arrow there, B. Now, if we compose them, yes, composing these two, if I compose them in this order, that gives me a map, UV, from P to P, with the property that if I if I do this composite and then P1, well that's the same that's the same as doing this doing this part and then Q, but doing this part and then Q was P. The defining property of V was that Q1V is P1. The defining property of U was that P1U is Q1. So Projecting, taking this composite and projecting it onto A gives me that projection back again. Same thing. Taking this composite and projecting onto B, well, this part is the same as just doing Q2. This part is the same as just doing P2. So this whole composite is P2. Okay. Again, a typo. It's supposed to be 2. But we know that's true if you put the identity arrow in place of B. P1 composed with the identity is P1. P2 composed with the identity is, is P2. And P is a product, so composing with those two projections is unique. So you, the composite UV has to be the identity on P. The composite BU has to be the identity on Q. And I wrote this in parallel to the proof on, on of theorem 1 on terminal objects. I tried to keep the notation parallel, except that it's partly wrong. 
This is really the same as uniqueness of, of terminal objects. Any two products have to be isomorphic. And, but here's the, the answer to, to your question. Um, U is not just some isomorphism. U gets along with the two projections this way. So the definition is not just some isomorphism, it's an isomorphism that changes one projection to the other. V is not just some isomorphism, but Q1V has to be P1 and Q2V has to be P, not Q, has to be P2. So it's an isomorphism that gets along with the projections. And in any book on categories here, I'll put it that way, but I, I, I like this. Proof of theorem four. Suppose P1, P2 is a product diagram and U and V is an isomorphism. Well, you just do, you do the same thing as we did in, in, theorem, in theorem two. Once you know that V is an isomorphism, you know it has an inverse. Again, this is, this is sort, of, sort of constructive. It's the definition of an isomorphism that it has an inverse. Mm -hmm. Not exactly constructive, because you, it might be hard to find that inverse. But we stipulated that it has an inverse. And now I'm claiming this, this composite is also a product. Take any T with arrows F and G to A and B. Well, we know it has a unique arrow to P that projects the way it should. That arrow composed with V is an arrow to Q, but that arrow composed with these, those two cancel out, they give us back the, the two projections. So just by the same reason as we used in, in theorem two, this data, it gives you arrows from Q to A and B that make that a product. So products are defined up to isomorphism. We don't know. We can, we can write this notation. This is a great notation, and I will use it in a little while. I will, be, I, I will use this notation a lot, but we don't really know what this object is or what that arrow is. We just know this is some object, and in this situation, there's always a unique arrow there. That at least it makes the diagram, makes these equations true. Other general, other general constructions from set theory have categorical generalizations, disjoint union, function set, power set, also union if you want to. Um, so do general constructions from other parts of math. Tensor products. In set theory, we don't normally talk about tensor products. But in, number, in, in algebra and in number theory, we talk about tensor products. They have categorical versions. Um, base change from geometry and number theory. It's not, it's not really a set theoretic operation. This is an operation that number theorists use all the time. It makes perfectly good geometric sense. The set theory, you would not want to write that out in Zermelo Frankel notation, believe me. You can do it. You would not want to do it. It's, it's not something that set theorists are used to thinking about, etc. Stuff like that. And different constructions work in different categories. Not every category has products for every pair of objects. The category of fields almost never has products. Um, every, every field is a product, own product with itself, I believe. But different constructions work in different categories. Very special constructions that, you know, in, in, a, in differential geometry, here's something we often do in differential geometry. We, I don't know, I don't really do differential geometry, but you're working inside some space like this. This is a big space, 
and this is some smaller space inside it, it's got a tangent bundle, it's got the tangent vectors that stay in that surface, but it's also got the normal bundle. It's also got the vectors that point perpendicular to it. You might want to put little infinitesimal vectors all over perpendicular to that surface. And you would want to if you're a differential geometer. Uh, that has categorical forms, but it only works in special categories, very special categories. Very special constructions only work in, in appropriate special conditions. We'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow, uh, but for now I want to move on to functors and then natural transformations. So we could we could break it down. Thank you.